Okay, well, uh, morning, everyone. Uh, really pleased to be here this morning. Good to see all of you. Um, some of you, some of you names I recognise from previous three days. Um, because this is the last sort of plenary session, <clears throat> um, you know, just to say a bit about the event, uh, I'm sure Anita will be sending out a evaluation form. It'd be really good if you can fill that in, um, you know, uh, you might say, well, this has been really interesting, but don't ever do it again, please, Bowery. Um, or it might be, yeah, this is something that's worthwhile doing uh, every year and, and, you know, give us some sense of what you thought worked well, what's worked less well, uh, then it would be really helpful both to organising events in this part of the world, but just generally about how we do things and how we engage effectively with you. So um, please do fill in that evaluation or drop us a line. Uh, really pleased that we've got a, a panel on skills today. Uh, quite consistently uh, in this part of the world, then access to funding and access to skilled colleagues um, and access to training and resources generally are seen as big blockers to innovation. So I'm delighted that we've got a session where we can devote to talking about the skills challenges and some of the things that uh, colleagues are trying to do in the region to address those skills challenges. Uh, so um, without more ado, uh, we've got a great panel, as I say, um, Lynette from the OU, sorry, not OU, oh God, that was a bad start, cut, 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 um, <laughs> from uh, Cranfield University, uh, he's going to talk about um, MK University, uh, Paul from SEMLEP talking about the wider picture around skills, uh, Joe's going to talk about Innovate UK's uh, approach to skills, uh, uh, Tony is going to be talking about digital skills and Eamon is going to be talking about degree apprenticeships and the sort of training offer that universities and particularly University of Bedford uh, can offer. So um, we've got a really good panel uh, and so please do put questions in the chat box and without more ado I'll shut up so uh, we can hear what the panel has to say. Thank you very much and I'm terribly sorry Lynette. <laughs> That's no problem at all. Thanks very much, Julia. Okay, so so just to uh, just to talk, sort of introduce, uh, reintroduce myself. So yes, I'm a pro vice chancellor at Cranford University, and as Julian mentioned, I'm uh, I'm also running the project to establish MKU proposed uh, new model university for for Milton Keynes. So I'm going to focus. On, in this session on sort of the, the, the picture around recruiting, retaining and upskilling. And, and I will also pick up on degree apprenticeships, which I know Eamon is going to talk in more detail about later on. So just to kind of paint the picture of where I think we are and, and in the UK and, and kind of why this is an important topic for, for today's conference is this point about skills gaps. And we're, we're seeing a lot of evidence from, from the OU and from the CBI and from others about the, the chronic shortage of digital skills and the cost to UK businesses. And of course that situation has got far worse in the last year because the demand, particularly for digital and data and technology skills has absolutely gone through the roof in the last 12 months. So then thinking about, well, how does that impact on your organizations and thinking about how we generate those knowledge, the, the, the sort of the digital skills and the technological, technological skills that you need. I kind of said that I think there are three points to look at here. I think you need to think, what are the, the knowledge and skills that you need in your business? What levels of the business are you addressing? And that's that's something that I, I think will be picked up by Eamon when he talks about apprenticeships in more detail later. And also I think there's something about, are you going out to recruit or is it about retention and upskilling? So, so then and before I, I finish my session, I will talk a little bit about MKU and the idea about applied learning and co-designing and co-delivering and also building a, a broader portfolio of skills. So, so that's, that's the kind of the, the broad shape of what I want to talk about today. So uh, I'll start with recruit, retain and upskill options for innovation. And just a couple of points about recruiting. And that's that in this era of where we're suffering from real shortage of these 
high tech and digital skills is that we need to look at a wider pipeline and therefore we need to think about inclusivity in recruitment and just to sort of make the point there are tools that you can use for example there are tools actually in word that will help you to pick up on whether your the language that you're using is inclusive the word there, there are people who will um, help you to take out the unconscious bias from things like job adverts. So there's quite a bit that we can do around recruiting for innovation and recruiting for skills. Um, and I want to talk about a couple of uh, things to watch out for. The, the first is about the danger of AI. Now, there are, um, there are people who are using AI for handling um, recruitment processes. And that can work well if you know exactly what pond you're fishing in and you know exactly what you want and you want more of the same. I do know of companies who've had a problem with their AI, which is that they've programmed certain decision rules in. And that means that actually they're not seeing a full range of candidates. What they're seeing is, if you like, the standard candidates. So just be aware of that, that the um, that AI there is a known problem with AI, which is that it can be very, it's very influenced by the initial kind of programming settings. And if all your programming is done with a certain type of person in mind, that's all it will produce. Or in the words of one company I know who stopped using it, they said, quote, we got close. And that's not going to lead to a kind of innovative workforce. Um, and then, so then another approach that's being used by a couple of other companies that I'm working with is gamification. So where they're setting up games and sort of competitions and using those as a way of recruiting. So in other words, they're not starting by looking at CVs. They're actually starting with, let's, let's, let, let's get people to play games and show us their aptitude. But then the second thing is about retention. So I just want to talk a little bit about training and personal event as, as a retention mechanism and I think if you're going to be recruiting and running a high skill workforce you need to think about that that kind of human motivation to want to learn and want to upskill is very much something that people are are seeking and then finally then that brings us to upskilling and something that I, I mentioned very briefly earlier on is this idea of learning portfolios so one way that we can think about upskilling people is we can give them a portfolio as we will be doing at MKU the students will have their learning portfolios uh, and they can add to those and that might include things that aren't if you like standard knowledge and skills they might be things like volunteering. So it might be that there are people who've got very good team working or innovative skills that you only find out about because of their portfolios. Um, and then the other thing that I've seen working really well is this idea of competitions. So um, I've been looking at uh, working with some organisations on discovering that the hidden talent they've got working in the back room because they run a competition. And what they discover is people who have been doing perhaps relatively low level jobs but are um, quite keen on programming or um, working on, on sort of computer games and things and actually have a lot of in their own time and have a lot of useful skills that could be brought into the business. So that's just some ideas around that. Um, I then wanted to talk a little bit and I, I will walk you through this quite quickly, but there's a, there's a lot more information here for you about tailoring. I mean, this is an apprenticeship. It's an example of an apprenticeship, um, but it's also about more generally how you can tailor courses to fill those skills gaps that you've identified in your business. So I think um, I've identified here six steps which is the first one is scoping, and I already mentioned this, so this is what skills do you need and at what levels of the business. Uh, then I think when you're working with a provider, um, then you need to be working with them around the fine tuning of the, of the curriculum. They'll usually have a broad brush, and then there should be some scope for you to fine tune. If you're designing an apprenticeship, then you should be thinking quite early on about what accreditations and endpoint assessments you're going to be wanting to do. Accreditation in particular, I think in some of the kind of innovation and digital skills areas, it isn't necessarily the traditional certified type of sort of professional institute skills that people are looking for. They're often looking for perhaps, if you like, vendor accreditation or certification. So things like Microsoft skills, Apple skills, 
um, you know, Azure, et cetera, those, those sorts of things uh, are becoming quite valuable in the marketplace. Then you've got to think about how you attract potential applicants and not forgetting that this is an opportunity to upskill amongst your existing employees as well as to recruit uh, externally and thinking about widening participation. So, so opening up to people who perhaps don't have conventional qualifications like the backroom people that I was just talking about who in fact are doing very advanced computing in their own time in their bedrooms. So it's how do you widen up access to, to people who don't have those, those traditional qualifications and then moving people through that process of applying and getting offers. And actually for particularly for people who are not coming from a, a traditional, you know, three A levels type of background, even going through an application process for a, an apprenticeship can be quite daunting. So I was talking about a course outline, and this is just a, a, a simple example here of the kind of thing that a provider ought to be able to show you, and you ought to be able to work with them to get some fine tuning around what you need. So you can see that there are core areas in the green, there are professional skills. So I talked about this idea of building a broader professional skills portfolio, and you can see that color-coded in purple here. Um, we've got some things which are actually delivered by different parts of the business, uh, different, so not the, the management side of things. And also, you should be able to see from your provider some elective choices. And you might want to work with your provider to think about what sorts of elective choices you want them to offer to your workforce. So, so that's, the, that's the kind of broad outline. And then you should be expecting to, to work with them to get the detailing to deliver exactly what you need. So just very quickly then about MKU, what we're going to do is we're designed to be different. So we're aiming to fill these digital um, skills gaps and have a wider participation and, and applied skills in these four areas, engineering and robotics, business and entrepreneurship, digital and data, which I think will be our biggest area of, of demand, and then design thinking. So that's, that's kind of very quickly about us. And then just saying heads up that we are um, beginning with four degree apprenticeships. So we'll be offering these, well, from about May this year, we'll be in a position to start uh, offering them with a larger intake in September. And as you can see, we've, we've done that with, um, with support from SEMLAP. So uh, a shout out to SEMLAP and thank you uh, to them. And we're going to be offering three technical degree apprenticeships, data scientist, digital and technology solutions, and cyber security. And then also the chartered manager where I just showed you the, the course outline. The chartered manager, as you saw, um, will also have the opportunity to take some technical electives if that's the kind of, if you want a digitally enabled manager to really drive kind of innovation and development in your company. So uh, we're going to be delivering these from a location in Milton Keynes and as I say we'll be looking to take our first intake from the late spring uh, of this year. So that's a very fast run through MKU and at this point I'm going to say thank you very much. I saw there was a question about slides and I'm sure that uh, um, Anita and Julian you'll, you'll deal with this and you'll be, uh, we'll be happy to share. But I now want to hand over to Paul Thompson from SEMLEP to talk about SEMLEP skills strategy. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Lynette. And good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, just to explain uh, who we are, South East Midlands Local Enterprise Partnership. Uh, local Enterprise Partnerships are bodies that are set up to help the economic development within certain geographic areas. Uh, there's 38 of them dotted around the country. Uh, we kind of sit between the government departments and the local authorities, if you like, but very much employer led in, in the way that we actually work. So um, our particular area is at Bedfordshire, uh, Luton, Milton Keynes and Northamptonshire. Um, here we go, there's the slides. Um, bad population, close on 2 million, 887,000 people in employment and, and we track the job postings and we get about 165,000 job postings in the area in a year. Um, the area has been extremely successful. Um, and one of the reasons is that we, we have tried to listen to the businesses, not just ourselves, it's our stakeholder partners, some of which are presenting today. Um, and as I say, we're very much employer led and we, we do this through engagement groups, um, the reports and consultation surveys, 
uh, and like I say, we track the jobs vacancy data as well. The area, as I say, has been very successful. It's one of the most innovative areas in the country. Um, we have high employment levels uh, compared to the national averages. And in places like Milton Keynes and Northampton, for example, we actually have more jobs than working age population, um, which might explain the traffic. Um, so, I mean, it's, it has been extremely successful. The downside of that is we do have a tight labour market. Um, and you know, Lynette kind of mentioned that you know one of the challenges is obviously skills uh, and recruitment, and that does come up time and time again. So our, our skills strategy here, and we're actually working towards a new skills strategy. This is the first time really we've kind of showed some of this. Um, so these are kind of our ambitions and our objectives, but it's very much about aligning the provision facilities and activity with our employers' needs locally. Um, kind of removing these discrepancies that we have between skills and attainment needed by employers and actually those held by individuals. Um, really informing and raising the aspirations of our talent pipeline, so those within education coming through, we want them going in the right directions with the right skill sets. Uh, enabling people into employment. I mean, I said we have a tight labour market. We want everybody working. Um, so any barriers that there are to that, we want to try and remove those. And those within work, we want them to progress. Um, and as I said before, everything wants to be delivered through employer-led engagement. There's lots of evidence to actually say that the more employer engagement we actually have with the delivery element side of it, the more impact it will have. Good quality labour market information. So making sure that everybody's well informed and really to try and help simplify things there is so much provision out there at the moment a lot of provision we need to provide some clarity of that um, so there's some work to be done there as well so if we move on the the kind of we're kind of shying away a little bit about talking about sectors certainly in our kind of work we've always talked about sectors um, but when you actually look on the skill side occupational groups are more relevant um, and certainly the occupational groups within engineering, manufacturing, digital and business operations, um, they cut across so many of these sectors um, that it's better actually to talk in those kind of uh, terms than, than anything else. And on the business operations and management side, you know, there are certain shortages, some of those which are listed there, but also things like procurement, human resources, um, particular challenges that we actually have within the area. I mean, there are some sectors which are tie up really with the occupational groups, so health and care, education, logistics, construction, they've all got their own particular challenges at the moment. Um, certainly with health and care, you know, we have an aging population, um, hello, um, they're going to need looking after. So, um, you know, we have a growing population, we need more teachers, um, you can't help but not see all the sheds that we actually have in the area, um, big on logistics, it makes perfect sense. And we are tasked with building a million houses between Oxford and Cambridge by 2050. Um, we've also got the East West Rail Link, we've got HS2 as well. We need people for construction. So I'm pleased to say that the business surveys we do, businesses report to us that the hard to fill vacancies are reducing. They're still quite high. Um, and the main reasons given are skills within the workforce, lack of work ready young people, and a low quantity of applicants. But there are cross-cutting influencing themes as well. So people talk about employability skills, digital skills, uh, there's the adoption of automation and technology. Um, leaving the European EU is definitely having an impact and that's only been magnified uh, with the impact of COVID-19 as well. Um, and as I said before, I don't want to keep harking on about it, but we do have an aging workforce and it is actually gradually increasing. Now, when we talk to employers and they say about employability skills, it, it, they kind of come under four kind of categories, really. There's the basic skills, and this tends to be rolled around English and maths, but it can also be basic digital. Attitudes and behaviours, um, and which is slightly changing, the need has changed, certainly with COVID-19 and people working at home, um, being trustworthy, being reliable. Um, there's a lot of trust being placed in people now. Um, but, you know, if you're working in health, you need empathy, that kind of thing. The key one is core competencies. You might call them transferable skills. Some people call them soft skills. I'm afraid we don't. They're not soft, they're vital. Um, so communication, organizational skills, teamwork, collaboration, 
certainly the top three that come up, digital literacy as well. I'll talk more about that in a second. And then the technical and vocational skills, which align to those occupational groups I showed previously. And then we have qualifications. Um, now, I have to say, most of the time we're talking to businesses, they don't talk about qualifications, but they do play a part. They are important. Um, certainly that first step for individuals into the world of work. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, digital skills, as I said, there's basic, which um, is basically, can you turn a computer on? Can you get to your bank account? It is that simple. Um, the most important one is digital literacy. Um, and that usually is Microsoft Office and predominantly Microsoft Excel. Um, that said, there are some business systems like SAP and Oracle, which um, come up an awful lot at this kind of level. And then we get into the specialist skills, and this is more related to in, independent digital occupations. So things like programming, coding, uh, cybersecurity, data analysis, marketing, design, all these kind of things. So we've identified certain priorities that we need to work on and help and support locally, and they, we've aligned these to the employment cycle. So there is the development of the talent pipeline within and, and from education. There's engagement into work, and that's for individuals. And then there is recruitment into work, and that's for employers. Um, development within work, and then business startup. And it's a little unusual to see business startup in something like this where we're talking about skills. Um, but certainly if you're teaching entrepreneurial skills within education, it helps develop all the core competencies. It's a great way of applying and developing them. Um, and also it gives people the insight maybe to the future to actually look at starting their own businesses. Terrible, you talk about digital skills and I'm terrified of pressing the wrong button on here. Anyway, what's going on? Um, so, the work that we do is actually helping facilitate some of this activity. So certainly working within the talent pipeline, we've got 74% of our businesses do not engage with education. We need more. We need more businesses getting in front of young people um, to actually kind of show and inspire them, show them what the world of work is. The more we do that, the more we will inspire these young people and the more informed and the better decision making they will make. And we need to push some of these people towards the occupational groups we'd need. We are desperately short in some areas. So we really do need to showcase them. And the only way we're gonna do that is through the businesses and the organizations. And also to help inform us as well in terms of what the needs are. Um, the other thing, and let touched on this a, a couple of moments ago, certainly the, um, the strengthening of the workforce, the research we did in the consultation we did with businesses, there was lots of uh, cases of best practice of the kind of thing that businesses were doing now to actually kind of change things. Certainly in terms of um, developing early entrance into um, occupations through apprenticeships, level four, level five qualifications, um, open recruitment, changing the way and the messaging and the language that you actually use to make sure that you are inclusive, diversity plays a part, and helping to, to use channels to re-engage people back into the work, world of work. Development within the workforce, upskilling, reskilling, staff retention, investing that time. And it usually is time is the problem, not money, um, to get people to actually upskill and reskill. They have a lot to actually offer within the business. And as I say, yeah, we have an aging population. Okay, that's the third and last time I will mention it. Um, but there are a group of people there that should be harnessed and used. They have a tremendous amount of experience. Um, and the majority are really open for actually kind of learning new skills um, and, and adapting. And the other one is, is fair kind of terms and conditions. And a lot of that revolves around the real living wage. Um, and certainly from the research we did, um, I would say nine times out of 10, when there was an issue within a business with this, it wasn't deliberate. It was, they just didn't know what the labor market was and what the rates were. Um, and so, again, there's some work we've got to play with that to try and help people inform it. There's lots of support out there. I know Tony's going to talk a little bit in a moment about some of the, the kind of stuff that we've got. But when you get these slides, there are links on here that you can actually click on to, to see where you can go and get help. We have innovative further education in the area. It's recognised as some of the best in the country. Um, we've made heavy investments within it to help focus on engineering, construction, manufacturing, digital, um, Lots of the areas where we do need help and support. 
We have one of the new institutes of technology as well at um, Milton Keynes at Bletchley Park, to, uh, focusing on digital as well. Um, so there's a lot of good provision at this kind of level. And the new white paper that came out from government last week, there'll be a lot of focus on this kind of going forwards. But also when we get to higher education, you know, we're, we're at a similar kind of level. We've got some fantastic facilities here in, in the Southeast Midlands. Um, new campus sites, new STEM facilities at the University of Bedfordshire, for example, down in Luton. Um, we have some unique facilities, Cranfield University with a postgraduate side, um, internationally recognised um, in a university. The Open University, the biggest university in the country, hasn't got any students actually in Milton Keynes, but it's the biggest university in, in, in the country. Again, the unique in the way that it actually works and operates. University of Buckingham with a new medical school at um, uh, Milton Keynes Hospital, and as Lynette's already mentioned, MKU coming along as well, which will be truly innovative you know, in this kind of area. We also have independent training providers in third sector, um, a lot of which do some fantastic work, uh, certainly on apprenticeships, traineeships with specialist groups and cohorts um, to helping those into work. Uh, and again, there's lots of resources and information on our website that can help and support you with that. And again, I know Tony's going to talk about this in a moment, but uh, the, the COVID-19, uh, one of the good things is it has kind of pulled everything kind of together within the training spectrum. So there's lots of provision out there, certainly with the plan for jobs, uh, help and support to get people into work. A lot of them come with financial incentives. Um, the Kickstart scheme in particular will actually help young people with paid work placement places um, for six months. Um, so it's a great opportunity. Job Centre Plus with a sector-based work academy programme. So if you've got particular shortages of a certain type, they will work with you to get people heading towards that area. Um, there's new ones coming along like Restart to kind of help unemployed people back into work. There's lots of opportunities. Yesterday, there was a thousand pounds announced for traineeships as well uh, to help and support businesses. Um, so these are all listed on our um, Growth Hub website. There's also the national programs on the skill support side for redundancy, unemployed in the workforce, to help with upskilling and training and, and getting people into work and building better opportunities, which actually helps people of certain cohorts um, into work as well. So that's our bit. Um, there's information on the websites, et cetera, and we'll take the questions obviously later as well, and I'll pass you across to Tony. Cheers, Paul. Thank you very much. So I've got the uh, control of the screen now. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks, Paul. That was uh, really, really informative. I know a few bits, but uh, as always, there's more bits and pieces coming down. I just want to spend a few minutes um, covering some of these in terms of uh, a program that's called Digital Future First. This is a ESF uh, co-finance program, and it's really, I suppose, sitting there as, a, as an intermediary sort of a coordinating, centralised approach to everything uh, from knowledge transfer to kickstart to skill support for the workforce, a lot of stuff that Paul uh, has mentioned earlier. It's a free to use service, as I said, because it's funded from ESF. And it's very much around just trying to centralize what's around in the region to support people like Lynette and Eamon and Paul and everybody else who's doing things from colleges, universities, ESF programs, everything that's around uh, that's a lot of people just not either not aware of or, or not, don't understand how to access it uh, without any sort of, um, should we say, grief or, or, or the level of bureaucracy that's included. Uh, so let me just quickly run through in terms of an overview of some of the grants some of the incentives and some of the support that is available to, to businesses uh, across our region. Let me get the, oh, oh, that's it, okay. So let me just give you a quick a bit of a background. Digital Future First, uh, it is, as I say, centralized free to access. Uh, it runs across the whole of the SEMLAB area. Uh, it's, we are based in Northampton. It's, it's, what's, it's three SME uh, businesses. Uh, I run up a, a, a small social enterprise, a community interest company called the Learning and Skills Academy. Uh, we have two other partners, one's called Database for Business, another one's called Suppliant. We're all three commercial uh, SME businesses. So we're talking business to business here, uh, and we're talking about people on the ground, understanding what's available. And it is an SME focused uh, program, although of course we do access and work with, with some of the larger companies in, in the area. Let me run through some of the programs and I'll run through some of the things that are also happening as well as, as Paul alluded to. Um, into what's coming down the line. Um, some of the grants, and I'll, I'll, I'll just spend a minute or two on some of them, um, and it is literally from our website, there's a bit more detail about all of these. 
Um, you know, when, you, when you've got people in work, and Paul quite rightly mentioned the need to upskill uh, relevant skills of, of, of the workforce, and there is a national program which is regionally delivered. Uh, Circo have the contract for delivery and they have their own partners who deliver this and we work very closely with skill support for the workforce. It's a funded bespoke, as it says there, training up to NBQ level two. Now, having worked in this world for many years, you know, we all talk level two, level three, pre-entry level, level four, level five. Level two is five GCSEs, grade A to C. And everyone has the right uh, in law to gain their first level two funded by government. Uh, you should be coming out of school with a level two, five GCSEs, grade A to C. If you don't, uh, there is additional support to get you to those five GCSEs, grade A to C, funded by government. So just leave that there. That's changing in April to allow some level three courses, uh, which Boris Johnson, Prime Minister, has mentioned. I'll get into that in a second, but there's about 400 courses which will be available further, further down the line. From a different funding stream which is yet to be yet to be yet to come into, into fruition for those workforces who are not uh, in a situation where they're taking people on they're having to make people redundant again a program is available called skill support for redundancy <clears throat> again it's a bespoke trend to help people to reskill so you know there's mention there of, of, of sap or, or, or prince or various programs that will help people reskill and prepare them for work in other sectors or in just in, in, in other employers that's available now. It's been on the ground for almost, well, I, I used to work on these programs six, seven years ago under different, uh, different ESF funding rules, but they've been around for many years and they're going to be around until December 2023. So the programs are there to be accessed. Apprenticeships. I'm not even going to start about the levy and all the various bits and pieces. It's, it's, I've spent many, many years trying to get my head around uh, you know, apprenticeships, the changing world as it does every 10 minutes. But there is grants available at the moment to the end of March for taking on a new apprentice 16 to 18 years old up to three grand uh, if you're over 18 to between 18 to 24 it's a different funding level it's two two and a half thousand but there is money there to support you as the employer to take on people and put them into apprenticeships um, where digital future first sits is very much about an initial information so it'll give you enough information, hopefully, to make you say, right, I would like to know a little bit more about that. Digital Future First is sitting there as, a, as an access, or as I said, an intermediary to all the programmes across the region. We're totally impartial, totally fully funded. There's no cost. It's very much around just sit and talk to us. Know, know enough about the programmes to point you in the direction, hopefully, of the right provider who will be able to deliver the support for you as a business that's more relevant rather than it, it is very difficult, you know, uh, trying to trying to get these things together. Paul and I have worked for many years trying to get some centralized database of stuff that's around in the area. And it's it's a, it's like trying to grab air. It, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. Kickstart, as, as, as Paul mentioned, uh, it's a program which is changing uh, at uh, where, where, you know, Learning Academy, Learning Skills Academy is a Kickstart gateway, but uh, where it works is it supports you as a business to take on staff for 25 hours a week uh, and get their salary paid for at minimum wage for six months. Also, up to £1,500 per placement for you as the business owner to support them in their employability and their the skills and training that they need as a person whilst in your workplace. You can take uh, more than one person, and we've got employees working with us who are taking 12, 15 people, uh, and it's a, re it's a really, really good programme, uh, and we are helping those in work access other support as well through things like national career service and, and all of those things that people need for employability the skills that were mentioned earlier you know problem solving resilience attitudes behaviors to get people uh, you know more ready for long-term sustained employment traineeships been around for many many years and really just came out to uh, raise their profile over the last few months when uh, when the prime minister announced there was another 110 million going into the traineeship program it basically takes uh, people who are, um, I'm sorry, Kickstart is for 24 years and under only. Uh, traineeships take people who are unemployed and put them into a, a work placement whilst staying on universal credit. So you take somebody on a traineeship which says, okay, I'll give somebody a, a, a work placement. And this is anything between 70 hours and 250 hours over a period of time to be agreed to work in your business to achieve a level two with a named provider. So we will support you as an employer to say, right, you're looking for people you'd like to take them on. They've got to go through a, a training program with a nominated pro training provider, which will help you access. 
give them some skills, give them some pre employability skills, give them some functional skills, which is basic, as, as Paul was mentioning earlier, uh, maths, English, IT, that sort of thing. But also there's an incentive for support of £1,000 to the employer uh, to, to help you to, as an employment to, to take somebody on, as I said, as an incentive. We can help you understand a bit more about that and help you access that. Knowledge transfer partnerships, uh, the guys here know all about them. These have been around for nearly 20 years. Uh, I remember in my previous life when, when they did come out in 2003, 2004, I think it was, Great, great programs in terms of a three-way between a university, an employer, and a graduate. With a, If you've got a specific project in mind, uh, they can help you to take on a graduate. And there is um, there are some grants and some support to minimize the cost of trying to deliver that project within your business. Internships, I'm not going to spend too much time on some of these. Um, you've got um, programs which obviously are taking graduates and putting them into businesses. Uh, and, and taking their knowledge and using it within your business to help it grow. Time to Grow is, a, is another program that's available there to, to help graduates get into, rec uh, recruit graduates into business. Uh, and the University of Northampton, University of Bedford, we work closely with them. Growth Hub, uh, you know, we work closely, very, very closely with, with, with the Growth Hub, uh, quite rightly too. They've got, a, you know, seven or eight advisors on the ground. The amount of information they've got for things like, um, premises for things like marketing programs and things like lots and lots of programs that we would be able to help you access working with the growth hub is is, is, a, is, a, is a key area within any business within SEMLEP area to understand some of the range of other funding and other support that's available there's a program around called growth curve which is there to support uh, business leaders business managers uh, in terms of your own development to understand how to how to make your business work uh, effectively, I think is the, is, the, is the phrase that we would use. Uh, it's a great one. Uh, both of our partners, DBFB and Suppliant, uh, uh, the managing directors are on that programme and we work closely with, with the Growth Hub pro, um, programme to, to help support it. And then you get into things like um, helping people before they get into work. So you've got work placements. Now, work placements are very much around saying, right, I'm going to take somebody and I'm going to offer a work placement in my business, very similar to a traineeship, but there's no necessity to actually go through the getting them a qualification. You might have someone say, right, come in and work in my business for a period of time through working with the Department of Work and Pensions to offer an opportunity to give someone some experience on their CV. And then there's another program around called Skill Support for the Unemployed. This is very similar to the, the Skill Support for Workforce and Skill Support for Redundancy. It's run by People Plus in this area, uh, and it's funded training to, to level two to help people prepare for work. And that includes things like employability. And there are a lot of things coming down the line. Uh, you may have heard of digital skills boot camps. Uh, this is a £32 million call. It's currently out by the Education Skills Funding Agency. They've run some pilots up in Leicestershire in the northwest of England. It is for level three uh, digital skills and upwards, things like coding, programming, cybersecurity, et cetera, as Paul was mentioning it earlier. They are going to be coming into place, and the call is out now. So they're going to be coming into place June this year to support people to get digital skills at level three and upwards. Generally, in our region, we're, we're, we're pretty much under par for, for achievements in level three and level four, and, and even level two to, to a degree. So, you know, there are a lot of support requirements at this level two. Level three is two AS levels, level four is a diploma, level five is a degree, just for, just for some background information. There are, um, as I mentioned before, around about 400 level three programs coming on stream as, as being able to be accessed as, as fully funded from about April. Uh, that's coming through a different funding stream called the Education Budget. And there are lots and lots of employability and lots and lots of programs around to help you as a business actually take on people, upskill them, recruit, train and retain, I think, as, as, as Lynette was talking about earlier. Uh, and it's, it's this, I didn't know what was available and I don't know how to get it. And that's what Digital Future First was set up for specifically to do. Um, let me get on to the next slide. That's one second. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty much it from, from mine. I just want you know, it's a whistle stop tour of some of the things that are available. Oh, sorry, sorry, Joe, go too many slides forward. Apologies. If you'd like to find out more, it's very, very much around just going on the website. It's free to access. It's very much a straightforward, yet you're interested in finding out some more information about some of the programs. We refer into the Growth Hub. We refer into Circle. We refer into People Plus. We refer into apprenticeship providers. We refer into lots and lots of organisations. We sit here as a as an intermediary, 
try to help businesses and organizations understand just what's available to them and really how they can access it. That's pretty much me. Um, and thank you for the questions that are coming through. I think we're answering them later. Uh, I'll pass on now to Joanna Burgess from Innovate UK, if that's all right with you. And uh, thank you for your time. Hold on two seconds. Uh, how do I do this? Excuse me one second. Right. Thanks, Tony. That's great. Um, apologies, everybody. I'm, I'm mitigating a single point of failure of being in the middle of North Yorkshire and having very, very poor broadband. So I'm going to keep my camera off for this bit just to just to avoid any issues. Um, but I'll turn it back on later. So if I just click here. So I'm, I'm Jo and I'm Head of Innovation, Talent and Skills for Innovate UK and it's really great to be here today uh, and I guess what, what is important for me here is to understand how we innovate, interact and can support the work that goes on within the, the LEP community and the skills ecosystem that exists. Um, and I just kind of thought it would be a bit of a bit of an opportunity to kind of reflect very quickly on what Innovate UK is about and what, what we're here to do. And then hopefully how that will then uh, connect with the, the, the presentations that we've been having to understand what Innovate's role is in supporting that delivery of the skills agenda. But equally, just to touch upon um, some of the interventions and, and activities that we do do to help support skills development. So. I know you're all aware of probably Innovate UK as an organisation, but Innovate is the UK's innovation agency and we work with people and companies and partner organisations to drive, find and drive the science and the technology in the innovations that will grow the UK economy. So that's a particularly where, where we sit and our responsibilities are very clear there to determine which science and technology developments will drive our future growth. So in terms of, of Innovate U, U, role in talent and skills, what, what we have is a very unique community with Innovate UK. Um, our community is working at the cutting edge of Innovate and innovation and technology and we're delivering this through, as you're all aware, priority sector development focused on mobility manufacturing materials, um, AI and data economy, ageing society, health and nutrition and clean growth and infrastructure. There are our kind of key priority areas um, and we deliver, deliver, we deliver activity through the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund activity, which is where we are really focused on highlighting the innovation and technology we need to pull forward innovation. So that the in, the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund works across a number of areas linked to the priority sectors, including things like the Faraday Battery Challenge, Future Flights, Driving the Electric Revolution, um, the Audience of the Future, Commercialising Quantum Technologies, you name it, we've got it, and it falls within Innovate UK's footprint. That alongside our tent, our community of the Catapult Network, which is 10 catapults focused on bringing together business, science and technical specialists that are really working on late R&D interventions that are, have the really amazing potential to bring ideas and, and, and business to market. So thinking about the community in which we operate and function within Innovate UK, we have a very unique position to support the eco skills ecosystem by connecting the work that we're doing around innovation, the thought leadership and the foresighting we are doing in the future in terms of determining what the skills needs are for a future agile workforce. So how we connect with the skills industry and the regions is going to be super important to supporting and informing um, the, the skills piece and the, the, the future investment in skills that the UK economy needs. We're also concerned with the fact that few industries or businesses, particularly SMEs, are, are able to anticipate the skills and capabilities that their workforces will need to deploy. So it's really important for us that we can connect with the business community to understand the future needs of the skills that, that, and the pipeline of the skills that will need to deliver business growth and innovation. So that is where the kind of strategy sits at the moment. 
Uh, and we're concerned with that. And part of our strategy is making sure we connect with the skills ecosystem and pull that intelligence through. But we also do stuff uh, and we also deliver skills initiatives. And I just wanted to take a bit of an opportunity to, to do a whistle stop for tour of, I guess, the Innovates activity in this place. And before we move on to the next slide, I just wanted to raise with the audience that in development at the moment, which is due to launch in April 2021, is a leadership for development for growth support service that we're developing as part of our offer through Innovate UK Edge, which will be about supporting the founders of leaders of high growth SMEs to support and grow their business. So there's some there's some new programmes coming down the pipeline, um, but I'll just take you through the programmes that currently exist. So yeah, Anita, if you could you could move forward. So let me introduce you to some of the Innovate UK support programmes, which are focused on the development of people and teams and business. Um, Innovate UK has got a history of funding projects. We fund innovation and technical projects. These programmes are concerned with supporting and developing the people and the businesses that we need to be able to deliver these projects and deliver the innovation. So the first programme I'm touching on is a Future Leaders Fellowship. Uh, and this is, this is a fellowship programme or a, a development programme for the brightest people with the brightest ideas. Um, and it, it, it's imperative for us to ensure that, innov for us to innovate, to ensure that the business community know that this programme is there and that they are eligible to apply. It, it is not just for academic staff. And we are, we are very aware that the terminology of fellowships is very academically weighted, but this is a programme that is equally open to business as well as academia. And as you can see, the funding for this programme is typically up to 1.2 million for over four years. It is open to any size of business in any sector and in any region. Um, and um, the, 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 it, it opened up, we run a number of rounds a year and we are just about to, we've just gone through round five and assessing that at the moment and round six is due, due to open shortly. So Anita, if you could, if you could just move on to the next slide. The objectives of the Future Fellowship Scheme is to develop and retain and sustain innovation talent in the UK. We want to keep innovation talent here. So this scheme is the objective, one of the objectives is to foster new innovation career paths, including those in business. Um, uh, to, and to facilitate the movement of people that can really drive forward um, um, innovation within their business. It's to provide funding and resources available to develop ideas and business. And it's to provide long-term flexible funding where businesses can tackle difficult and novel challenges and support adventurous and ambitious programmes. It's a grant of up to 1.5 million over four years. It's open to businesses of any size and any sector. Um, it's impact focused and, and it really encourages collaboration. We have a number of workshops, we have a number of, 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 of um, webinars around the Future Leaders Fellowship that we're running in partnership with the KTN um, so that there's lots of information out there and, and as I say round six will be um, launched shortly. Anita, if you could just move on to the next slide, that'd be great. Just to give you a bit of an update of where we're at from a business perspective. So 13.6 million pounds worth of funding has been awarded to 16 fellows based within UK business so far. And over 60% of the businesses that have been awarded have been SMEs. Uh, you know, this is not about corporate investment. This is about access to funding for, from, from SMEs. And a quarter of a million of that one point um, of that 13.6 million has been really focused in supporting training and development activities for business fellows, ranging from very specific training right through to funding MBAs for them as part of their fellowship. So it's a really it's it with the 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 onus is on the fellow to develop their their four year program and to identify the best use of that funding and um, to enable them to a develop as an individual and 
B, help and grow their business. So it's a really, really powerful programme. And I'm really keen that we diffuse and, and raise profile of the, the opportunities of the Future Leaders Fellowship within the business community. Um, so if anybody has any follow up questions that we, we, uh, around FLF, um, we can we can answer those. So if you want to move on to the next slide, Anita. The next programme I just wanted to focus on was the Women in Innovation. Um, and the aim of this competition um, is to find women um, with exciting innovative ideas and ambitious plans that will inspire others. And the awards are for female founders and co-founders or senior decision makers of women working in businesses that have been operating for a year, at least a year. Um, a key element is the applicants of this award and must be confident um, with support of the award to make a significant contribution both societal, environmental and economic through their innovative project. Each award um, provides £50,000 worth of funding to deliver this programme. But from a skills and training perspective, again, £50,000 can contribute towards the, 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 fund, the award winners' personal development but being part of the Women in Innovation programme, they become part of a really powerful peer network. And that peer network comes with tailored support to support, coach and mentor the women that are leading this, um, that have been recipients of the grant. It's currently closed at the moment. We're just, we're just going through um, awarding this year's applicants. And I think the, 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 the launch of the next round will be coming um, very shortly. And you can log into government. If you look into Women in Innovation, I should have probably put the link to the, to, I should have put the link to the government um, website on the slide, but, but you can log in and register for their newsletter, which you'll be able to, to, to um, identify when, find out when the next round is being launched. So that's our Women in Innovation programme. Anita, if you'd like to move on. Um, ideas mean business. Um, this is a really exciting um, uh, campaign which was launched in partnership with the Princess Trust and Innovate UK. And, and it really was a campaign that was to inspire young people from any background to innovate and be successful. And the Ideas Mean Business campaign launched Innovate's Young Innovators Awards scheme, which has been running for a couple of years now. And the Young Innovators Award is where young people can apply for an award to make their business idea a reality. And it's open to anybody between the ages of 18 to 30. So it's, it's a wide enough span. Um, the award includes a 5,000 pound grant and it is tailored, offers tailored business supports, coaching, mentoring, and a living allowance to those that have been recipients of it. Um, we hold regional innovation events um, across this to make sure that we, we cascade as much of this information um, out across the UK. Um, again, unfortunately, this year's round is closed, but again, keep an eye on those for those people that work in the intermediary space. I'm sure you're aware of it already, but um, if you, again, um, uh, you can log in and to so the government website and it will it, log into their newsletter and you'll get updates of when the next round will be open. So that's the Young Innovators Award. Um, Anita, sorry if you can move, move on to the next slide. So iCure, um, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but this is a this is a this is a program that's really focused on spin out and and innovation that that is the product of uh, university research and university spin outs. Um, so the innovation to commercialization of, uni of university research is what, what iCure stands for, is a programme collaboration between Set Squared, um, North by Northwest Partnership, Midlands Partnership, Innovate UK, um, UKRI and the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy, so BASE. And it's basically designed to move ideas and innovation out of university and into the marketplace where it'll have the biggest impact. A phenomenally successful program and basically here to support 
early career researchers and spin outs to undertake three months of full time intense market assessments and to have meaningful conversations with at least 100 prospective customers, regulators, suppliers, partners and competitors to really understand the commercial possibility of their innovation and their business idea. So the businesses can apply for up to funding of £30,000 for market validation activity. But the important thing about the skills piece of this, it includes a significant support package for all these successful programme applicants to, 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 to undertake leadership and management development. So those really important cross-cutting themes that we all know we need to have to enable businesses to grow and develop. There is a new scheme that has launched literally yesterday, which is called Scaling the Edge. Um, and this, this Scaling the Edge programme is, is really focused on supporting entrepreneurial talent within SMEs. Um, it's around building the skills and the business building capability within existing SME businesses. This is hot off the press. And what I would say is the Scaling the Edge programme, if anybody would like to li link with me on LinkedIn, I did a post about the Scaling the Edge programme yesterday. So um, please feel free to, to add me on LinkedIn and you'll, and you'll see, you'll be able to link through. But equally, it's also Scaling the Edge is available for, um, through K the, the KTN on the KTN website. So thanks, Anita. Am I all right for time? Okay, great. You know, when time flies. <laughs> um, so that's iCure. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, Anita. So I know Tony has touched on um, the KTP partnerships already. Um, KTP is, is an innovate um, product. And as you say, it's it's been around an awful long time. Um, knowledge transfer partnerships help businesses in the UK to innovate and grow. And it does this by linking them with an academic or research organisation and a graduate. Uh, and it enables the businesses to bring new skills and latest academic thinking structured around strategic innovation projects. There are also now um, management KTPs, which is a relatively new concept. But the management KTPs have been developed to, to fill, a, fill a gap around that not just the, 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 the focus around a business innovation or a, a technical innovation, but to bring partnerships together focused on the business growth and the business innovation side of things. So the management KTPs are, 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 are we're really keen to raise awareness and, and grow, that, grow that portfolio again, because that's really linked to enabling business growth and innovation through investment in the, the kind of management and leadership side. So we know that KTP is part funded by grants and the amount you need to contribute depends on the scale and length of your project. And it also depends on the scale of your business and the size of your business. Um, typically small and medium sized enterprises contribute around 35,000 pounds per year, which is about one third of project costs. And large businesses contribute around 55,000 pounds per year or half of the project costs. So, that was just a kind of a quick snapshot into Innovate's position. Our position to wanting very keenly to work with joining up the innovation ecosystem with the skills ecosystem, but also a, a, an overview of what we are doing practically to support um, skills within, within business innovation through our various partnerships and programmes. Um, and happy to, to answer any questions um, in the next stage. Thank you. Great. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Joe. Uh, next up is Eamon. Thank you. Over to you, Eamon. Thanks very much, Julian, and thanks for the opportunity to um, to, to speak this morning. That's 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 great for us. Great for me. Thank you. Um, I um, head up the University of Bedfordshire's um, short and um, CPD courses, and I am our apprenticeship lead, um, working with employers across the region. I've now spent quite a few years at Bedfordshire, but before that, I spent two, two, uh, 10 years at, rather at the Open University. So I feel as if I know the region reasonably well. Um, what are we doing in Bedfordshire to try to assist employers in the current circumstances? We all know the challenges, I think. 
Um, basically, we try to address three main aims to help employers meet um, key higher level skills needs. And um, I think we're indebted to, to Paul and colleagues at SEMLEP for doing some excellent work on sector skills requirements over the last few years that have really informed what we, you know, what we've set out to do. Um, we're also trying to help employers. Um, I'm going to give some practical examples of the employers we've worked with to try to address productivity issues through um, techniques like methods like uh, Lean and Six Sigma um, working. Um, and thirdly, we are aiming to, in the current climate, to put together packages of training and development that help businesses um, sustain and, and recover in the short to medium term. So a little bit more detail in each of those. Short upskilling courses, I'm going to illustrate those. Things like Prince2, Chartered Management Institute training at level three and level five, as well as the Lean Six Sigma program I've mentioned. A range of apprenticeship training programs, and I'm going to tell you what we currently offer uh, as an illustration of what a, you know, a, a modern progressive university is able to offer to employers. Um, we give specific support to employers looking to recruit apprentices. And that's something I've been quite surprised at the level of um, help that, um, that employers have asked us to give and that we've been pleased to give. So I'm going to illustrate that with a few examples. We have a very active careers and employability service at, at Bedfordshire, um, and they are clearly there mainly to help employers tap into our graduates. Um, and then finally, colleagues of mine at the university have run over some years and continue to run um, programs that enable um, students and graduates to carry out um, pl paid placement activity to help uh, smaller businesses with um, strategic projects they have in mind. So I suppose it's fair to say the key focus of the sort of skills development we've worked on in the last few years have been around digital skills. No surprise, that's what Paul's been telling us and others have told us employers really want. Interesting to hear what Tony was saying about that earlier on. Um, leadership and management, and uh, I've mentioned business improvement, uh, mainly through Lean and uh, the Six Sigma methodology. So looking more specifically at apprenticeship training, we're currently offering training for 16 um, higher and degree apprenticeship standards. And I emphasize higher because I personally feel that there is a real need and opportunity to work with employers at levels four and five. That's the first and second, the equivalent of first and second year of university programs, right up to postgraduate level. But level of four and five, we've had great demand for our apprenticeships at those areas, and we will continue to work in that really important area. Um, just to say we are working with levy payers, of course, but also non-levy paying employers now, and with 95% of training costs now covered by government funding, that's a real opportunity for smaller employers. Um, and so we have put in place special agreements and so on that reflect that government funding to allow non-levy uh, employers to, to join in. Um, currently 62 apprenticeship training contract, contracts in place, and that's currently with 44 employers spread over um, the uh, Midlands and the South and East of England. So examples of those apprenticeship programs, um, project management is a key theme, really important for us. So we have contracts currently um, in the public domain with a number of uh, SEMLEP employers. Uh, including um, um, including Vauxhall, uh, PSA, um, and uh, a, a range of other automotive and aerospace employers. We've just introduced the level six degree apprenticeship in project management too. Um, operations departmental manager and chartered manager um, fitting into that leadership and management mold. Senior leader, interestingly, most of our clients are from the public sector and they are largely health trusts at this stage. Really interesting the work that um, health professionals, uh, clinical and support staff are uh, interested in, in that program. Um, on the digital side, data analyst, um, 
and uh, an important one for us, digital and technology solutions professional um, with specific pathways in a number of areas, software engineer, network engineer, and the cyber security pathway, um, and dealing with a large um, digital uh, services employer in Milton Keynes, who specialize more in kind of legacy systems, mainframe systems. So we have put on a variant of that program for that employer. Uh, have a sort of aging workforce. I think they'd agree with that age profile and they really want to bring younger people into that specialist skills area. Cybersecurity technical professional, that's um, our uh, probably most notable client there is Bank of England and we're very proud to have them on board. Um, digital and technology solutions, uh, we support two divisions of BMW um, and on the associate project manager level, our first and main client for some while was Tesco PLC for their headquarters staff, food industry technical professional. That's one I really do like to shout about. It's a great program. Um, we haven't attracted anybody from the Southeast Midlands yet. So we look forward to food businesses coming to us for that. We're currently delivering that for a large Heathrow based um, food producer. I'm just gonna move forward. I can. Yeah. Um, what kind of support can we give to employers for apprenticeship recruitment? Well, first of all, we can post vacancy details on the national portal and you, need, you do need to do that in a particular way. So we help on that. Uh, sorry, we've jumped back. That's it. Thank you. Um, we therefore, you know, thereafter share the resulting applications, of course, with the employer and help them sift and assess those applications because not everybody is uh, completely familiar with um, some level three qualifications. Um, so we do that sifting for them and we go as far as suggesting the kinds of interview questions they might want to consider. Um, Anita, I'm ready to move to the next one, but I don't have any arrows. No, oh, okay, thank you. Um, so examples of employers we've given that kind of help to uh, include an aerospace business in the in the Southeast Midlands, um, a housing association uh, just outside the region, but but nevertheless connected with it. Um, and I mentioned that computer services business in Milton Keynes and uh, a um, specialist electronic components manufacturer um, just outside the region, but it, uh, close close to us in St Albans. Um, there is a, a new digital brochure that we'd be very glad to send to um, any of the participants today. Um, so please do get in touch with us if you'd like a copy of that, skills at beds.ac.uk. Um, and again, uh, very happy to speak to anybody who's got an inquiry or interest or to any of the panel members who'd like to know more or to think about how we can align better, how we can, in a sense, join up where it's possible to do that without, without um, Clearly, there are elements of competition, but there are also opportunities for alignment, and I'm very interested in that. So thank you very much indeed. Great. Thanks, Eamon. Um, really interesting presentation. I was fascinated to see you were very kind in focusing on private sector colleagues, rather than the fact that you had half a dozen uh, universities, uh, which seem to include Oxbridge and Russell Group universities coming coming to you to deliver their higher education. It's, and Cranfield uh, as well, I'm pleased yeah, to say. Yeah, I know, it's uh, really good. Um, uh, well, thank, thank you for the whole panel. We've now got about uh, 15 minutes for questions. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there are a couple of questions in, in the chat room which uh, I'll pose to you, uh, but do keep them coming in. Uh, so, so the first one was, was a reflection on, um, you know, soft skills and the, trend, or sorry, core competencies. I think that's a far, it's a better phrase um, for the reasons that Paul outlined. But those sort of core competencies of being able to work effectively in an organization, you know, thoughts on, uh, one, you know, how, how do you transfer those skills or, or is that just through the interview and recruitment process? Do you explore that? <clears throat> and secondly, you know, do you think they're changing? Um, you know, uh, any reflections on uh, how the last year has changed? Maybe some of those core skills uh, that we have. I, I don't know who'd want to kick off with that. Lynette. 
yeah, so thanks for that. And um, I, I would say that uh, certainly the businesses that I've been talking to in developing the provision at MKU, it's come up repeatedly. And even in some quite technical areas, I mean, such as AI and robotics, there's a real need for people to have a broader set of skills that enables them to explain to colleagues or explain to customers or you know, interact with teams. And it's been interesting having, we've been running what we call skills gap workshops with groups of companies, particularly SMEs, and asking them what, what kinds of skills they're looking for. And frequently they'll spend a few minutes talking about specific technical skills and the rest of the time they're talking about professional skills transferable skills so so i do think it's something that is coming up the agenda and that is seen as important and that's why i made that mention about about actually you know encouraging all learners to have a portfolio where they're evidencing that broader set of skills which they may not only be getting from education they may be getting it from other things that they're doing on a, on a personal level as well Cool. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Paul, I mean, you talked a bit about this, so any reflections from you? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I concur with what Lynette said. I mean, we, we talk for employers, it's all they talk about, uh, quite frankly. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and the core competencies, whilst I, I draw that list of 10 that we, we see on that diagram, they differ depending on occupational group or occupation that you're working in in the order. The, the one thing, the one change I would say um, is that digital literacy just moves up and up the list every time we, we look at this. Um, I suspect now since COVID-19, if we were to run the reports and the research we did again, it's going to move up again. Um, um, look at us today. I mean, without it, we'd be lost. Um, so, yeah, it, it just it become more and more important. And I mean, that's quite right. You know, the, the newer occupational groups, the digital groups and things like that, the emphasis on communication skills and teamwork and collaboration in particular. And it's been very interesting. We, we've included the type the word collaboration. We've always referred to it as teamwork. But the fact that the nature of that kind of uh, business is working with other organisations outside of, of the, um, the uh, organisation you work for, um, you know, that, that, that's become more prevalent uh, in, in what, what's been happening. So the other thing I would say on this is that um, I've never met a young person yet who has not got some core competencies. I've met hundreds who can't evidence them. And, and that is something we really do need to work on uh, in terms of making sure that people can evidence the, these core competencies that they have. Um, yeah, I, I mean, hopefully, uh, uh, well, I, I mean, the careers and enterprise um, I'm, I'm an enterprise advisor for my local school and, and you know, one of the things that I really enjoy doing, which we haven't been able to do this year, is, is to do the mock interviews. And it's turning that, um, well, you know, I'm captain of the football team, um, I've got grade eight music, and it's a bit, well, you know, don't hide those under a bushel. I mean, those are great skills and it shows real achievement and determination. So I think it, it comes back to your plea, doesn't it, Paul, about employers getting engaged, whether it's with a provider or with a school, um, that, that experience is invaluable, as well as schools love you because you fulfill the Gatsby criteria as well. But, but just to quickly push back on yeah. that, Julian, okay. I don't think that, you, that they, those sorts of skills are well evidenced through an interview process. That's why I was no. talking about an admissions, yeah. you know, companies who are using these more different kinds of admissions processes, because that's what they're trying to get, is that evidence through through interaction. So people as set cases, tasks, assessment centres. I think they're much better ways to draw those, those the real evidence out. Cool. But we need to get those Point people taken. into that situation. Yeah. Could, I, could I just, yeah, great conversation. Um, I've, I've worked with um, people who, um, I suppose from disadvantaged backgrounds for, for many, many, many years. And um, I'm with Paul on this. I don't, I don't find anybody who hasn't got core skills who just don't realize it. You know, um, our workforce has got something like 7 million people uh, with the average reading age of an 11 year old or under. Now that's 25% of our workforce. But I've, I've, I've worked with many, many people and, and I, I always remember one, um, one lady who is a single mom in, a, in her late twenties, three kids, and she was desperate to get a job and she couldn't get any interviews. Her CV was, you know, I've got nothing to put on it. 
And we went through what she did for the day. And she says, I get the three kids up, I get them dressed, I get them breakfast, I get them to three different schools. I come back, I get my mum to the hospital if I have to go there, I go and do the shopping. I pick the kids up, I come back, I get the tea, I clean the house. I then, <laughs> you guess where I'm going with all this. Uh, and, and then I make sure they get out to the dancing and to what they're doing. And I was like, you've got organisation skills, you've got time management skills, you've got financial skills. You're just not aware of how to communicate those skills in a way that an employer is looking for. And that's the message that's always come across for us, which is this misalignment or misunderstanding or lack of awareness that, you know, in business, you're looking for specific things to support the growth and development of your business. The skill sets are there. We just seem to have to get them out of people to be aware that actually when you're looking after you know children or house or yourself you have got skills you're just not aware of how to communicate them in a way that an employer gets them hobby horse over no thank you i think it's a really important point i mean joe did you have any thoughts because we tend to deal with um a rather more grown-up audience hopefully uh, certainly by age um rather than sort of uh, young people at school, you know, mostly we're dealing with people who have been through the university system. You know, any reflections on those core competencies from the work that Innovate's trying to do in this space? I, I, I'm, uh, what we hear time and time again is that in order for businesses to be able to tra attract funding and capital, it completely depends on the strength of the team that's presented and their ability to attract, attract um, uh, that, that kind of financial input is, is, really, is really dependent on, on, on that. And my reflection is there is a big piece for us to do to look at to support founders and leaders of, of companies as they're trying to grow and scale their businesses in the, in the cloud of a pandemic. And we know that people are feeling exceptionally isolated exceptionally um you know quite very isolated in terms of the decision making and how they grow and develop their business and that's certainly something we're very mindful of when we're developing the leadership development for growth support program that we're looking to put in place we know that they're having to make incredibly difficult decisions you know we we only had to hear about monzo's banks it's significant climb to, 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 to be one of the most successful startups, you know, creating, th you know, th announcing 300 jobs in 2019, which had to literally be slashed within, within, within a 12 month period. Uh, and so we know that leaders and founders are having to make very difficult decisions. But equally, what we do know is that businesses are really keen to attract talent. Uh, and what we do find is that businesses talk to us about actually it's very difficult to connect with the talent within a graduate community, particularly, particularly as the graduate recruitment space is completely and utterly dominated by corporates, corporate graduate schemes. And I think we need to think really innovatively about how we link our innovative SMEs with really, really talented individuals. And I'm not talking just about undergrads and graduates. I'm also talking about school leavers. So I think there's a significant piece of work to be do done around thinking about how the, we utilize the FE, um, the white paper, to really look at bringing businesses to the heart of that skills ecosystem. Because at the moment, the skills ecosystem is fragmented and it's not connected. And we, ne we need to find a way of pulling this together in order to have young people um, to be able to, to, to access really high level skilled jobs, but equally for businesses to know where they can attract and, and, and bring their talent in. And I know there's some amazing schemes that are run out of universities. Um, but we're still hearing that young people are, are, are struggling to find work. So I think there's definitely some something we can be done in that space in terms of talent match. Cool, thank you. And um, we're running out of time, but I think that segues really neatly uh, into uh, the last question that uh, Lynette has already answered. So I'll go to you, Lynette. So, so Mark, Mark was really saying part of the problem maybe is, is that we just don't know, employers don't know uh, what they need um, and that's uh, in part because they're not sure particularly at the moment about where their business is going to be taking them 
Yes, so, exactly. Um, and, you and know, how, how do you improve that side of it? Yes, absolutely. So, so you know, it's, it can be about looking at what they making a kind of skills map of the organisation to, to see what's what's there and, and what might be needed. And I say the other thing is to build some flexibility into that as well. Uh, so it, it isn't for, for example, at the moment, you don't necessarily want to replace like with like. You want to think about people who can grow and learn and what that development pathway might be like, um, because certainly what you might be able to do is recruit somebody who's got the potential into the role and you might be able to get them on a, on a fast track training like the kind of thing that Eamon's doing um, that would get them to that point quickly. So I think it's about having that that view of, of the sort of the jigsaw puzzle and how the different pieces could go together. I, I mean, Mark oh. says, is it dithering? Well, I don't think it is. I just think by, by its nature, business is so rapidly changing, particularly at the moment, it's a challenge. So build the flexibility in. Great, thank you. Uh, Eamon, I'll, I'll give the last word word to you on this because I am aware that we're, we're almost out of time. Uh, obviously, the University of Bedfordshire does a lot of um, management training with, with leaders as, as well as more junior colleagues. You know, wh where does that sort of thinking about talent progression come into, into the programmes that you're offering? I think it there's no there's no simple straight answer to that julian <laughs> i know we haven't got a great deal of time but just to say that it really will and picking up the next point in a sense it, it will depend on getting an understanding of that of that organization's requirements identifying existing strengths uh, you know looking at the their capacity to uh, or their wish to develop existing staff or to bring in new people um, i'm dealing with a large employer who I say large, you know, 80, 80 employees, they're not an apprenticeship levy payer. They've had to make significant redundancies in the last 12 months, not surprising probably in the nature of their business. And now they want to bring in six um, school leavers that they can train up. And I, I, and I just think, you know, that that's a, a story of our times. And, and the, the trick there will be to work with the directors of that business, the three directors of that business to really understand what they want in some, is it a rotational sort of program? Are, are that, you know, are they looking for people with a particular, a particular strength in finance or in IT or rounded in, more rounded individuals? You know, there's no one size fits all, but um, I hope that's helpful. That's how we've, that's how we try to approach those conversations with employers. Yeah, I, I mean, it does feel that the message coming across, hopefully, and it's come across loud and clear from, from all the panel is uh, come and talk to us, really. Um, you know, uh, access our website, uh, come and talk to us, uh, and we can have a conversation with you, which, frankly, uh, I think is really important because the other thing that's come across to me is there's an enormous number of things out there. And if I were an employer, I would just feel really quite bemused about, well, where do I start? Uh, so, you know, having someone who can act as that signpost feels like just really important, doesn't it? Brilliant. Uh, well, uh, we're one minute over. Thank you all, uh, my panel colleagues, very much for keeping to time and answering our questions. Uh, thank you, uh, all of you who uh, joined, joined the session. I hope you found it useful and interesting. And as I say, do follow up on any of those queries with any of the panel members uh, if you want. Some of them I think will be in the exhibition. Uh, I will be there from, I think it's 12 till one, if anyone wants to have a chat with me. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you all very much. I hope you enjoyed this morning's session. Thanks again to the panel and um, stay safe. <laughs>